Hi, it's me, Katie. And me, Adrienne. And you're listening to Kindled. A podcast where we dig into the science behind building relationships and environments that help kids unlock their full potential and become empowered learners. Together, we'll discover evidence-based tools and methods that will empower you to kindle the curiosity, motivation, and well-being of the young people in your life. Hello and welcome to Kindled. Katie, how's it going? So good. How are you? I am good. Just kind of realizing I have a lot of things in my, all the little buckets I'm in charge of. (laughs) And so I'm trying to go, okay, summer's coming. We got to have a plan. (laughs) Yes, totally. I'm trying to get my kids like all squared away on their goals and things like that. And like making sure that they've accomplished all of the things that we set out to do this year academically. And I actually was just going so crazy trying to, I was just feeling like really overwhelmed by that. And so I was rereading some self-driven child stuff and talking to Bill and Ned a little bit more and felt inspired to make an an appointment system to like honor my time a little bit better instead of me being like, Hey, you want to do some math hacks? Hey, you want to like, you want to practice? Like, um, let's do some handwriting. I just made little post-it notes that said mom appointment 745 and put them. I, I just stuck, I made four of them cause I have four kids and I just stuck them on the wall and the kids were like, Whoa, cool. Like an appointment. And then they mom. get to pick it whenever yeah. they want to come so we, and do something with you. Yeah, now, totally. Do they normally come to you and say, I want to work on math facts or is that you uh, going to them? No, they <laughs> never would say that sentence to me. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to clarify. They would say, hey, can we code? Or hey, can we build a robot? Or hey, can we paint? Or hey, can we read? Or something like that. But MathX has not made that hey, can we list yet. I'm sure it will someday, right? Actually, I just um, found this really cool program for MathX and it's been going way better than it ever has. I think that my son is really, I think he has some dysgraphia and some like working memory issues that we're like just trying to kind of dig into. So um, that's all coming to a head right now, but this appointment system like brought a lot of peace to our house because now it was suddenly like a benefit to like be able to have t- school time with mom. It organized their time so they could prioritize it. It's like, yeah, these, these appointments are going away. And instead of like, Hey, do your chores. Hey, get ready for bed. Hey, we got to do school. Like me working so hard to get them to do the things that are good for them. It really put it on their plate and to just say, Hey, right now it's six o'clock. We go to bed at eight o'clock. Sometime in that in that time frame, we're gonna need to do school and chores. Like feel free to finish your games, finish like whatever you want, but like you're gonna need to figure out how to manage that time. There's some appointment cards downstairs if you'd like my help or if you'd like to do it yourself, that's great. But it just made me feel like so much peace and there was a lot less fighting and I just had a lot less stress knowing like, okay, it is not my sole responsibility to force them to get this done. It's just like providing the option and the suggestion and like a fun way to interact just went so much better. Do you find that these types of systems stick or what makes them stick? Because I feel like we've done things like this and at first it's awesome. And then I'm like, what happened? We, <laughs> we stopped using them. So do you feel like what, I don't know. Do you feel like this will be something ongoing or is just kind of jumpstart this autonomy for them to manage their own time? I don't know. We'll just see. I'll give you some updates. Okay. Awesome. (laughs) Because I think lots of things that we try to do also fade, but it's something that I learned from my mom. Like she would make all these systems and they would always fade, but there'd always be another one. And which demonstrated to me that it wasn't like the system that we were committed to. It was the principle of hard work and being diligent. And that's like the the thing that I brought into my adult life from it. It's not like, Oh, my mom had the best sticker chart systems. Like that, that was nothing, but man, my mom really cared that we were hard workers and modeled that into us. Um, those are the kinds of things that stick. This is a perfect lead in to who we are talking to today, which is Carrie McDonald. Katie, can you tell us a little bit more about her? Yep. Carrie McDonald is a senior education fellow at fee and host of the Weekly Liberated podcast. She is the author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. In addition to her role at FEE, Carrie is also the Valinda Johnson Family Education Fellow at State Policy Network, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and a regular Forbes contributor. Carrie McDonald, we're excited to talk to you today. 
I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about Liberated and the journey you've been on with talking to Edupreneurs. Edupreneurs. How do you say that? Edupreneurs. <laughs> I say entrepreneurs. I'm sure there are other ways. Um, but yeah, you know, so the Liberated podcast um, launched in February of 2022. And it was really a, a desire to capture the stories of uh, entrepreneurial parents and educators beyond just my articles. So I write a regular column at Forbes where I spotlight innovative K-12 learning models. And I also uh, write articles at FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. And I just felt like it would be nice to have a more multimedia approach, especially because I love listening to podcasts. And, and I think it's a way that many of us consume information now, especially storytelling. And so I launched that and then it quickly became clear to me over the subsequent months that a once a week podcast wasn't going to be enough uh, to really capture the number of stories that I was hearing from these, again, um, entrepreneurial parents and teachers. So I, I last fall shifted to twice a week. Uh, and now on Tuesdays and Fridays, um, you know, these roughly 30 minute podcast episodes come out talking about, you know, education entrepreneurs across the country who are building non-traditional education models. Um, I have had Prenda micro school leaders on the podcast and of course, Kelly Smith, Prenda's founder, um, but also just sort of, uh, individual entrepreneurs who are not connected to any kind of micro school network, um, people who are just trying to solve a problem for their family and their community and bring others along with them. And it's really been exciting to hear their stories and be able to share those stories. And then also, you know, draft additional articles and do some case studies around this too, so that there's all different ways that now people can uh, understand what's happening in education, this real movement of non-traditional out-of-system learning models, and, and, and hopefully inspire, you know, more and more parents and educators to take the leap into entrepreneurship. And I get messages all the time. It's such a, a delight for me to hear um, from parents and teachers, especially, you know, teachers who are in the conventional system who are saying, I'm looking for an exit. I'd stumbled upon your podcast and now I feel inspired um, by listening to the stories of people who've done it before. I love that. And I think something that is really important to call out here is that the future of education really isn't like a new system or a new one size fits all thing. It's plurality right? This just multiplicity of choices, like that's the goal. It's not that like everyone starts a print micro school or everyone does this specific model, right? The whole point of the shift, the movement that we're trying to make here is that children are unique in their learning needs. Families are unique in their values and in their desires for their children. And there should be educational models and choices to meet each of those needs. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. I, I think it's really about moving from a centralized uh, schooling system to a much more decentralized educational ecosystem um, that's fueled by kind of bottom-up entrepreneurship, you know, everyday entrepreneurs who are, um, you know, creating these new learning models and reimagining education and moving beyond uh, sort of the standardized uh, schooling model that so many of us are familiar with to a much more personalized, um, tailored educational approach that's right for each child. Can you give us a few highlights about people you've talked to, like innovators, stories of specific people who you feel like have just done incredible things in this space? Oh, there's so many. It would be hard for me, uh, I guess, to pick just one or two, but I'll, I'll, I guess I'll share some highlights. The first uh, episode that I did of the Liberated podcast in February of 2022 was with Jill Perez. And I think her story is really representative of, of so many education entrepreneurs that I've interviewed over the um over the past year plus, uh, Jill was a longtime public school teacher in the New Jersey public schools. She had more recently in her career shifted over to also helping supervise teachers in training uh, at the college level, students who were um, becoming teachers. And so she was helping them along with that process. And when COVID hit, she ended up creating a, a 
pandemic pod, like so many parents did uh, across the country for her, for her children, for her four children, and bringing other like-minded families along. And so for that first kind of disruptive year, 2020 to 2021, she had a pandemic pod with a few other families, enabling uh, children to continue to learn and uh, be exposed to academic content, as well as have that social connection. And so many families in her area um, were interested in what she was doing that she um, was encouraged to create something a bit more formal. And so in the fall of 2021, she ended up leasing space and opening uh, a full-fledged micro school with nearly 50 kids. Uh, Again, mixed age, intentionally small, customized curriculum. She ended up recruiting uh, teachers from the New York City public schools who were sort of burned out from a year of remote learning and kind of ongoing uh, pandemic policies. And so they would come to work with her. And families could choose to attend her micro school called Tranquil Teachings Learning Center, either full-time, five days a week, or part-time. They were all recognized as homeschoolers, which is relatively easy to do in New Jersey compared to a lot of other states. And so they could be a full-time schooling alternative or a part-time homeschooling option at a fraction of the cost of traditional private schools. And uh, her program, again, was so successful that she ended up purchasing a building uh, the subsequent year, I guess early, earlier this year, 2020, or last year, this academic year, early 2022, um, and and continues to grow and flourish. So that's just sort of an example of um, of a common story of particularly former public school teachers who leave the classroom, decide to do something different, and especially that evolution from these pandemic pods or learning pods into more established kind of standalone micro schools uh, with hired educators. So uh, that's just one example. I could go on and on. I don't know if you have uh, other other particular stories you'd like me to tell or, you know, kind of different educational approaches. So I'd love to hear a story about a parent, right? Like we kind of, when for Prenda, we see it's about even like parents starting micro schools and educators starting micro schools, and they both have pros and cons and unique challenges on both sides. And so um, can you highlight someone who's just like a mom that started, that started something unique? Sure. Or dad, I'll give you the example of of James Lomax, who is a retired U.S. Navy officer and engineer and um, decided that he wanted to create a a better education option for his young child uh, who was enrolled in a private preschool, but he didn't really like kind of focus on all out academics, uh, you know, for three and four year olds, he wanted something that was much more focused on self directed education and personalization, and realized that that really didn't exist. So he had to create it. And so he launched uh, Life Skills Act and Academy in Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, Acton Academy, as I'm sure you and your listeners know, um, is a fast-growing microschool network started in 2009 in Austin, Texas, and and now has roughly 300 uh, microschools around the world, mostly in the U.S., and, and James, you know, his, his program was really, again, so focused on solving a problem for his family, wanting to create a better education option for his children, and then um, more and more families kind of gravitating to that model. And Las Vegas is an interesting place because while micro schools and these alternative learning models are flourishing everywhere, there are these clusters of education entrepreneurship, Las Vegas being one of them, according to our friends at the National Microschooling Center, Don and Ashley Seufer, they estimate that within a 10-mile radius of the Las Vegas Strip, there are uh, over 25 microschools serving more than 300 learners, and they expect that number to more than double to more than 600 learners over the next 18 months. So just tremendous growth uh, in this, this kind of alternative learning um, Uh, landscape and more and more families really gravitating to these models. That's amazing. And I feel like what I keep hearing is 
that parents and educators are realizing, oh, there are a lot more options. There are a lot more boxes on the shelves that we didn't even know existed. And sometimes it's almost like accidental. I know for me, that's how I ended up on this journey is you know, school wasn't working out for my kids and someone mentioned, oh, try this. And I was like, uh, but no, I my kids go to school. They go to traditional school because <laughs> that's how I was educated. That's how my husband was educated. And then it opened up this world of possibilities of, oh, education can look very different depending on what that child needs. And also I think what the world is needing as we grow and evolve as well. I think that's so true. I really think that um, as difficult as the uh, COVID response was, and especially in terms of education disruption and prolonged school closures and remote schooling, it really did uh, open parents' eyes to different ways of teaching and learning, is that it's kind of shifted them from that default position of my child goes to the assigned district school. um, And all of a sudden, parents said, well, wait a minute, you know, that school might be closed, or I don't like Zoom school, what other options are there? And of course, that's why we saw during uh, those kind of early years of of the COVID response, um, skyrocketing rates of independent homeschooling, more families choosing private education and charter schools, and really starting to see that there were different ways uh, of approaching teaching and learning. In fact, many um, that are, you know, quite accessible and affordable. Uh, And I think that that was something that was new for many parents. Parents realized that um, they had other options and that those options were better. So can you talk to us a little bit more then about the school choice movement, which is basically what we're talking about here? And like, what is it? What has this been around before all of these options have been coming to the surface? Or is this new? Um, And then how does it help parents and educators and ultimately children? Yeah, I mean, school choice has been gaining traction for for decades. I mentioned kind of the, the early charter school movement and the beginning in the early 1990s. And then certainly uh, this millennium, we've seen more and more interest in ex- introducing or expanding school choice policies that enable education funding to follow students instead of going to school systems so that families can decide um, the appropriate educational fit for their children and have access to uh, that taxpayer funding to make that happen. Um, And so, you know, like homeschooling and micro-schooling, these were, uh, school choice was also sort of a a movement that was gaining popularity um, pre-2020, and then it just accelerated, again, along with kind of homeschooling and micro-schooling. And so over the past three years, um, there have been record gains in school choice policies. Arizona, of course, last year becoming the first state to pass the country first universal education savings account, enabling all K-12 students in that state, over 1 million students, to have access to approximately $7,000 per student per year um, to use in whatever way they see fit for educational expenses, which could include private school tuition, but could also include micro school tuition or for learning pods like Prenda or um, educational therapies, tutoring, curriculum, homeschooling expenses. And more and more states are kind of following uh, in Arizona's footsteps, uh, particularly this year. We're seeing, you know, more and more states choose universal ESAs, Florida, Utah, Iowa, West Virginia is almost universal, Uh, Arkansas. So just a lot of momentum there as I think more and more families uh, and taxpayers recognize the value of enabling families and empowering families to um, decide the appropriate educational fit for their kids. We have personally been benefiting from ESA for a couple of years, and I had no idea it even existed until my kids were in a Prenda micro school. And we got one kid on it because I wanted to get the sibling on so that we didn't have to pay for OT out of pocket. And then we ended up getting a full amount because he got eligibility for autism. And it has enabled and opened so many doors for his education that are conducive to his mental health in ways that the schools would have never been able (laughs) to help him. And so we see that benefit in our own personal family. But then because I'm already in the ESA world, lots of people reach out and I'm, I work for Prenda. It's incredible just to hear the stories of how kids are truly getting their needs met when it comes to education because of programs like these universal ESAs. 
Yeah, it's really amazing. We have so much personalization and individualization in every other area of our lives. And yet, for some reason, we don't have that in education, um, that it becomes a sort of one size fits all model. So, of course, when we um, approach education with that same attitude of personalization and individualization, we're going to see much higher levels of satisfaction, much greater uh, educational attainment and academic proficiency than we would in, and again, sort of a one size fits all uh, model that we don't tolerate in any other aspect of our lives except for education. Yeah. An interesting analogy that I have started using is that it's like each family and each child has kind of like a basket of needs And we've been used to just handing that whole basket over to the neighborhood school and hoping that those needs are met. And now with the school choice movement, it's more like the parent is holding the basket of needs and gets to decide who they're going to hire to account for each of those needs. And they might sign up for a micro school or buy curriculum or something to manage those needs. They might be doing private therapies. Like, But it, it all comes down to what does that individual student need and the person who knows that best typically is the parent. So putting them in the driver's seat of how those needs are met is going to help increase the likelihood that every child will be getting what they need and progressing. Yeah. And it's like what Adrian said, you know, too, even for your, in your own family, right? You have kids taking advantage of different kinds of educational options because each child is different. So that's what's so great, especially about these ESA, the education savings accounts programs, is they really enable that customization for each child, uh, even within a family, because we all know that we have individual needs and interests. So as we talk about school choice, it seems like this is a hotly debated political issue. Can you give us an update of what's going on in our country? Then if you can give us both sides of the story so, you know, it can be fair and even and help us understand the policies and and why this is such a highly debated issue. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, you know, more and more states are um, introducing or expanding school choice policies. ESAs are um, becoming, you know, much more popular and implemented in more states, which I think is really going to expand education options for families in ways we just simply haven't seen. And will also activate more education entrepreneurship so that we'll see an increased supply of education options. There'll be a diverse marketplace of education choices from which families can choose uh, and so that they will have that that choice and abundance and I think you know the some you you sort of see that the polling suggests that most taxpayers now support education choice policies that enable education funding to follow students but there is of course still going to be resistance from the schooling status quo right I mean for those who kind of support district schools and government-run education systems this is a, a big change and a big threat and so you know that's understandable that there would be some resistance there. But I think, again, the the push towards individualization, personalization, and family empowerment is really strong. And and it will hopefully get us to a point where education is much more reflective of um, this sort of ecosystem of options that we enjoy in every other area of our lives. What about the resistance from people in the homeschool communities? Because I've been seeing that as well, especially with these ESAs, where They want nothing to do with that, even though they're supporting what they have been doing. Have you seen anything in that space? Because I understand why the schools would be resistant. But what about the current homeschooling or unschooling communities? Yeah, I mean, you know, homeschoolers have been fighting for their rights to educate their children for decades. Um, And I think we have to give a lot of credit to those homeschooling pioneers who really fought those battles when truant officers were showing up at their doorsteps and families were being harassed um, because they wanted to educate their children outside of, of a district school. So I get it. You know, I get that they're concerned that anytime we have taxpayer funding, um, available to, in this case, you're in your example, homeschoolers, which is the case in some states that have expanded ESA programs to homeschoolers, not all states, but some, I can see that they would be concerned about that. And they should be concerned. We should be 
continually observant and vigilant about encroaching um, government regulations and government control of the private education sector. I think that the response to that, though, is to say that, you know, that individual homeschooling families certainly don't need to uh, accept any of this taxpayer funding. They don't have to opt into the program. They can continue to operate independently but that there are many families who would like to have access to that taxpayer funding and then they should be able to. And I, and I think that although that there are these concerns of um, regulatory capture, that the, the benefit to expanding kind of the ranks of homeschoolers and, uh, and expanding education options more broadly will uh, create, you know, kind of additional momentum and certainly a larger population of people who would be available to push back against that creeping regulation. And what are some of the other ways that we can have legislation support choice that aren't ESAs? Are there other creative ways that states have found to do this? Yeah, I mean, Oklahoma had introduced, the legislature had introduced this year uh, a tax credit, which is sort of your, your kind of pure choice where you would just simply um, get a, a credit on your tax return if you homeschool your children or uh, send them to private school. I think that the proposal there was about $5,000 if you sent your kids to private school and $2,500 back if you homeschooled your kids. So pure tax credit, that money is not ever going to the Department of Revenue. Uh, it's staying in your pocket. So that's kind of purest form of, of school choice. But we also see and have seen for quite a while tax credit scholarship programs, um, particularly in states like Florida that have long had these scholarship programs um, that really enable more and more families to choose innovative education options. I spent some time in South Florida in the greater Fort Lauderdale area, which is also a cluster of education entrepreneurship and micro schools. Many of the education entrepreneurs there are running micro schools where uh, most of their students are attending tuition free or nearly tuition free uh, through the tax credit scholarship program. I can give you another example, illustration of uh, one such micro school founder. This is uh, Felicia Rattray, who runs Permission to Succeed Academy in Fort Lauderdale. She was a uh, a longtime charter school teacher and had recently gained custody of her nephew when COVID hit and there was the switch to remote learning. And she discovered through that experience that her nephew was, although attending, kind of enrolled in third grade, was actually operating academically at a kindergarten level. And she was unaware of this until Zoom school really kind of put the limelight on what was happening in, in his classroom. And so that was what prompted her to remove him um, from school to create a micro school. And uh, she incubated her micro school the kind of first year uh, at another location, another micro school location from a veteran micro school founder who had created her program prior to 2020. Uh, and then the program was growing so well that she ended up getting her own space. And she now serves about 20 students with four teachers in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And she told me that Without the tax credit scholarship program, only about two students would be able to attend her micro school. So vast majority of students are attending um, not only her micro school, but other micro schools in, in Florida and the South Florida area in particular through the tax credit scholarship program that's for low income families. But of course, Florida just passed a universal ESA program that's just going to expand that option to more and more families. And Felicia's goal, like many micro school founders goals, uh, is to expand lateral you know, they don't want to create kind of big private schools. They do like that kind of intentionally small personalized environment. So her goal is to have uh, one micro school in every county in Florida. Awesome. I love it. That's incredible. So cool. Okay. So I think it's really interesting that you're an economist first and then have like layered on the education. So explain to our non like ec economics savvy <laughs> um, listeners. Um, why choice is good? Why does choice increase quality? Oh, what a good question. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that it, it goes back to, again, seeing what we have in other areas of our lives when we don't have government control over, um, over market forces, right? So again, go back to cereal or go back to um, iPhones or, you know, uh, smartphones or, any, or cars, anything else that we're purchasing that is not run by the government, um, but that has a market of supply and demand ends up being higher quality because of that competition 
competition because of that need to be responsive to consumer demand and um, importance of innovation and invention that sort of drives entrepreneurs to create new things that make our lives better. And I, I think, again, we just don't see that uh, in the government-run school system um, that's really kind of stuck in this industrial model of, uh, of the schooling status quo. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say real quick, like when we're talking about government schools or government funding, like we're not attacking public school teachers, like the individuals in these systems are by and large well-intentioned and like love kids, right? So we're, we're really talking about like the systems that are in place, like a few layers above that, that make this innovation and choice difficult. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I often say is that, um, you know, learner creativity and teacher creativity are similarly um squelched in the government-run schooling system. Um, And I think that's why we see not only parents increasingly wanting to um, find a way to have their children leave that system, but we see more and more public school teachers also uh, eager to leave that system. And I would say the vast majority of the um, the people I talk to, the education entrepreneurs who are profiled on my podcast uh, and in my articles are former public school teachers who just became disillusioned by what they saw. Like you're saying, is that the system becomes you know so constricting and they're not able to be creative and be responsive uh, to individual learner needs. And the system hasn't changed a whole lot from when it was created, whereas our world is changing so much. So it makes sense of why this is happening. Yeah. In, in fact, one of my... Um, latest articles at FEE, at the Foundation for Economic Education, is called uh, In a World Full of Robots, Humans Wanted. And so it really kind of speaks to this idea that we have a a system of compulsory mass schooling started uh, in the mid-19th century, kind of um, matured through the industrial era where we, where schools were preparing workers for factory jobs on assembly lines and today you know we have we're in the innovation era and we don't have any idea what jobs of the future will exist you know many of the jobs that our children will be doing have not yet been invented they will in fact probably be inventing some of them themselves and so we yet we have this really kind of standardized archaic uh, industrial model of education. And and one of the things I say in the article, and I also write extensively about in my unschooled book is, you know, if we think about the characteristics and qualities necessary for the innovation era, it's things like uh, creativity, curiosity, inquisitiveness, and entrepreneurial spirit. And yet these are often the qualities that are crushed through our system of coercive schooling, where you know young people have to trade uh, originality for obedience and creativity for conformity. And this is even more urgent now as we increasingly coexist and cooperate and compete with Robots are artificial intelligence, right? We have to think about what distinguishes human intelligence from artificial intelligence. And it's exactly these qualities of creativity and curiosity and ingenuity. Uh, and, and yet again, these are often the qualities that are least developed and cherished within a, a conventional system of schooling. So it's no wonder that more families are looking to leave that conventional system. And also no wonder that more entrepreneurial parents and educators are creating new learning models. I think this really gets to the heart of like why we have started this whole Kindled podcast and Kindled project, because it goes back to the Plutarch quote, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And this is what we're talking about. We're, we're putting masses, millions and millions of kids in situations where the main goal is to fill up their brains with knowledge instead of kindle their curiosity and help them find their own motivation and creativity and kind of cultivate that instead of just like, can you pass this multiple choice quiz or test or whatever? So thank you for pointing that out. What advice would you give to a parent or educator who's not sure if making a a different choice for their child makes sense for them or like a different career? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, read as much as you can, listen uh, to as much as you can. The Kindle podcast would be a great place to start. I think that there's a lot out there now. So the first part is really just 
being aware of what's possible, uh, what others are doing outside of the conventional system, and then seeing if that feels right. And if it does, give it a try. You know, I don't think we should be afraid to experiment with that, whether that's parents who are going to pull their children out of a conventional school for a year and just see how it goes, uh, or it's a, an entrepreneurial parent or educator who wants to launch a micro school or a learning pod or a hybrid school or some other innovative model, you know, give it a try, give it a go. And, and you may find that it's even better than you expected. And putting the choice in the kid's hands and ha- giving them the autonomy to choose, that's kind of how we ended up on this journey is we asked our kids, do you want to leave school? Do you want to see what this is like? And they they did not hesitate. <laughs> they did. And whereas if they wanted to stay, we would have been totally fine with them staying. And so I think just attuning to what your individual child needs, which we keep talking about during this conversation, is really important. And then just being open to seeing what they want to do too. And if they're open to it. And then you just never know what the possibilities will be. And also I keep thinking, I'm like, once we left, it was like, okay, there's no turning back for us. But I talked to some families and, you know, they end up finding that maybe a more structured environment does work for their child. So they do go back. But most people I know end up staying out. (laughs) Yeah. And I would say too, again, if you're a parent who's looking for other options and you can't find exactly what you're looking for in your area, um, you know, maybe there are micro schools and charter schools and, and learning pods or homeschool collaboratives, but nothing feels quite right. Don't be afraid to go and build it yourself. And there's likely other families who are looking for that same thing. And I think that that's really how we create um, a true panoply of education options for families. It, It comes from Um, um, that desire to fill some gaps and create what doesn't yet exist. That's really, really great advice. So we are wrapping up our conversation and we would love to know who is, this is something that we ask all of our guests. So who is someone in your life that has kindled your curiosity, motivation, or helped you become who you are today? Oh, wow. What a great question. Somebody who has kindled my curiosity. You know, I guess I I would probably go back to my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who I was very close to, um, who always loved reading and poetry and music and kind of just uh, instilled a lot of that in me uh, and encouraged me to write from a very early age. And of course, that's now led to so many uh, open doors for me. So for sure, it would be her. Awesome. And how can people follow you or learn more from you? You can um, follow me at the Foundation for Economic Education at fee, F-E-E dot org slash Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y, or go to my podcast website, liberatedpodcast.com, and follow me on social media. My links are there. Probably best to find me on Twitter at Kerry underscore E-D-U. Awesome. And how can people find your book? My book is everywhere. Uh, It's in local bookstores as well as uh, online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Again, it's Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. And you can also find a link to that at liberatedpodcast.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I've learned so much from our conversation and can't wait to keep learning more from you. Thanks to you both. Great to be here. So that's it for today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Kindle wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, rate us, or share our episodes on social media and tag us at Prenda Learn. For more Kindle's content, head over to Prenda.com slash Kindle and subscribe to the Kindle newsletter. And don't forget to submit your questions or challenges and your Spark Squad nominations by emailing us at podcast at Prenda.com. Thanks for listening and remember to keep kindling.